Um, welcome everybody to the full council meeting, 27th August. Welcome to the elected members, staff and members in the public gallery. Sof um, Sophie, would you like to do the blessing please? Ia mātou e whiriwhiri ana i ngā take kei mua i o mātou aro aro e pono ana mātou ka kaha tonu ki te whakapau māhara hua pai mō ngā hāpore e mahi ana nei mātou. Me kaha hoki mātou katoa, ki a whaihua ki a tōtika tā mātou mahi, a mā te maia te tiro whakamua me te hihiri ka taia te arihi i roto i ko tahitanga me te aroha. And you did it really well. You were nervous. It was good, really good. Um, item number three, apologies. Any apologies? No. Item four, declarations of interest relating to items on the agenda. I have received no notifications. Item five, public speaking time for items relating to the agenda. I know there are three people who are wanting to speak on the airport issue. Although the airport issue is not at the agenda, if you look at item number 9.3, uh, response to uh, the organizational, organizational review report, page 50 to 53, there are a number of items down there in terms of reference uh, how council responds to uh, Manafenoa issues. I think that gives me the platform to allow uh, these three, sp three speakers to speak. I'm going to give you all, um, for the three speakers, Tony Matthews, George Jenkins, and Tony Jackson. I'll give you all um, five minutes each. And before that five minutes, there'll be a, a small bell-like sound. You need to wind this up. And then you'll be open for some questions. So the first speaker is um, Tony Matthews. No? George Jenkins. Tina Kato Kato. Name he can cut it. Anga Purum, Tina Kato. Emian Ahai, no my name is George Jenkins. I am the space person for the Tapu Hub. This model is a role given to me by Hu and Ellen Lake, who sought to protect the interests of their family and that's taken under the Public Works Act. occupied the airport in 1999. That protest was to voice again our serious concerns that we are realising at this present, which is that this land is about to be shut down, sold and subdivided into residential houses. It represents the final curtain over the lands of Pukitapu in this area. This is our last bastion as hapu, in terms of hapu interests. Pukitapu hapu has positioned itself alongside other members with a vested interest in keeping Paraparamu Airport, Kapiti Airport alive. We are a part of the Save Kapiti Airport group and stand beside organisations such as the Kapi Chamber of Commerce, the Kapi Aero Club, Sounds Air, Air Chathams, private airport operators, 
In that group, we are seeking a petition to save Kapiti. My appearance here today is to implore you as council to publicly support the retention of the airport. It is to ask council to publicly support the retention of Kapiti Airport. This council in the past, along with the Kapiti Coast Chamber of Commerce, fell hook, line and sinker for the lie that was a promise of future economic prosperity for this area, the lie that was proposed by Sir Noel Robinson for a new airport terminal and for the airport to become a key transport hub for this community. The rezoning that occurred as a result of falling for that lie has resulted in our present situation where the airport authority is very close to declaring that the airport will be shut down and the land rezoned for residential housing. The land, the airport authority, is owned by professional real estate developers along with a global investment group. There is no loyalty to this community by those interests. The loyalty to this community is represented here at your table and by those that are present here today. What we seek from you is conscience and principle. Conscience and principle to serve what is clearly in the best interests of this community. I believe that your position has always been that the Kapiti Airport is a community asset and as such should be retained at all costs. We will be positioning ourselves to enter into any talks with any organisation that seeks that end. I remind you that there is a treaty, a Waitangi Tribunal report due out soon and there will be a settlement thereafter. Anything that happens to that land will prejudice our interests therein. Therefore, again, I implore Council to use conscience and principle when dealing with the proposed rezoning for the subdivision of that land. Kia ora. Thank you, George. Um, can I uh, wait for um, the submission by Tony Jackson before I open it up to questions? Tony. It's ready to go, isn't it? I think. Okay, thank you. Uh, look, um, I'm following on from George George's statement. Um, my name is Tony Jackson. Uh, my father is Harry Jackson, a, a direct descendant of Ipiha Tinara through his daughter Iri Hapiti, who was an owner of the lands taken for the airport in 1939. Um, I also have the support of Poiria Love Erskine and Takari Kotal, who couldn't be here today, um, who are direct descendants of Ipiha Tinanara through his daughter Ruhia Ipiha. There are many others who support this statement, and I will table the names at the conclusion of the presentation that I think it's been shared anyway. Um, essentially, our lands were taken by the Crown unjustly. Um, the lands have not been returned, even though the lands have been used for private commercial purposes. We have legitimate claims being considered currently by the Waitangi Tribunal who have yet to release their findings and recommendations. Uh, we now hear that the lands are currently to be sold again, putting the lands further and further out of reach from us as descendants of the original owners and putting at risk the airport operations that the Kapiti community has depended on. We ask this council to support us. We propose a resolution from the Council that the Government immediately purchase the airport lands and allow Kapiti Airport to continue operating and hold the lands in a Crown land bank until negotiations with mana whenua can occur under an appropriate and mana enhancing negotiation framework. Nōrera, tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, um, if you just stay there for a while, and George also, uh, any questions from uh, councillors? No, uh, Councillor Randall. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, if the land, if the um, government purchased the land and gave it back to Iwi, um, <coughs> what is the future? I mean, is there any guarantee that the Iwi will not then sell it to sub developers or would they continue to use it as an airport? What would you, your thinking be long term if the land was returned to you? George, I mean, I mean, the airport's been there a long time and it's well used by different groups. Um, so I think the intention would be to leave the airport as it is at this stage. I don't, I mean, the future's things could change, but I mean, at this stage, the intention is to return the land and then leave it as an airport because it is widely used and, it, and it's an emergency, emergency airport for Wellington, supposedly. Um, so the intention would be to keep it as it is. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, having spoken with the Aero Club, obviously, um, and Air Chatham's sounds there, both have a vested interest in the airport. Their view is that in the future, with the opening of Transmission Gully, uh, there will be a further influx of people wanting to live in this community. Following uh, the lockdown, Air Chatham's reported that this route that they fly from Paraparamu Airport, from Kaipari Airport, is the most successful route for them. They feel that the commercial viability of the airport into, into the future looks promising. Our position from the Pukitapu Hapu has always been retention of the airport and we'll work with any parties that are that show a vested interest in the same. Deputy Mayor Janet Holborough. So I was just waiting for the red light. Thank you so much for coming and speaking to us today. It's certainly extremely valuable to have your support with this important asset. Are you making uh, approaches directly to central government as a hapu, as an ingo? There's treaty settlements with regards to the uh, re pending report. Should a declaration by the airport authority be received by the public that they intend to indeed shut down the airport, an urgent application before the Waitangi tri what Tribunal will be made to try to stop that sale. Through that process, we would intend that the government come to the party. There is a question that has not been tested yet regards as to whether the Crown has any power of oversight over their own airport authority. This airport company is constituted under the Airport Authorities Act 1966. And therefore, there is a link between this airport authority, if perhaps for the only the reason of a power of oversight in terms of the, the, the government requiring to check that the airport company is indeed doing what it is supposed to do. Through those avenues, we would like to set up a um, communication, if you like, with government, with central government, directly. Yes. Yeah, I'll just add, all I can say is that we, um, myself, my father, other family members here, attended a Waitangi Tribunal submission last year at um, Whakarongatai Marae in February last year. Um, in front of the government representatives and gave our submissions and now we're waiting still <laughs> for a response. So it's been nearly you know, more than 18 months. Conflict, Elliot. Marina, and um, thank you for coming to speak to us today. Um, George, you've um, in part answered my question already and I wondered if uh, just further if there was a precedent set already for the treaty uh, for the Waitangi Tribunal to come to early decisions about uh, an urgency as re in response to issues like this. I so said what I have already asked them to do, which is to provide us with a broad brush picture of what the report might indicate. And I've taken that to the Office of Treaty Settlements to ask them the same question. That in itself has never been done before. The precedent is to the opposite. However, in terms of a, a treaty, in terms of an urgent application, there have been previous urgent applications of this nature and the, tri the tribunal has typically found in favour of the claimants. 
because breaches such as this are so clear. These and such clear breaches, it is for those purposes, for those reasons, that claimants make such applications. Look, thank you, George. And your grief um, leaves a hole in the heart of this whole community. I just wanted to let you know that. Councillor Compton. Uh, Morena, and thank you for speaking to us this morning. You said you were part of the Save Carpety Airport group, and I know that members of that group have had discussions with uh, NZ Propco about where their thinking is at. Has um, Pukitapu Hapu had been party to those discussions? Have you had any discussions with the Templeton group or the other parties that are the current owners of the land? So we're looking to have that meeting on Sunday. Councillor Kutz. Morena, George and uh, Tony and Extended Whanau, um, thanks for coming this morning and um, sharing your um, taki with us in regards to this. And, and look, uh, from a personal perspective, I'm absolutely supportive um, of the returning of land to those that it has been confiscated from. The, the, the challenge that I have with this particular situation, and not in terms of that philosophical principle itself, but is um, there's one suggestion of the government buying the land, but there's the other uh, um, suggestion of the land being continued to be run as an airport. And I'm not all over the figures, but from what we've heard in the past, is that as a business, it's not necessarily a money-making operation. And so w w it might be too much of a technical question for this morning, but at a higher level, if the land is returned, there is the question over the actual cost of running that as a as a viable business and providing those services to the operators. So, you know, if the government buys it back and then runs it as an airport, that's on them. But if it, the land is in the ownership of um, of the iwi, then there's a question over, you know, whether they're responsible as a, as, a, as an entity for a, a business. I just wondered whether you have any thoughts about that or whether it... The principal question that was posed by myself to the safe to the other members of the Safe Carpet Airport group was indeed the future commercial viability of the airport as they see it. Their response is positive in that way. Regardless of what the airport authority is saying at the moment, airport commercial uh, airport operations at the airport proper in terms of commercial viability look promising to those vested groups, to those groups. The other side of it, of course, which we've already seen, is the development of surrounding lands. Now, as landowners, our simple objective would be to further both. Councillor McCann. Thank you very much for sharing. With your permission, um, Mr. Mayor, I just wonder if we could um, understand one issue is that Council changed the zoning in that area, um, which allowed the big box development, which as I understand it was to support the facilitation of the, the airport remaining. Did, did council, does council have any, uh, is that first true, that, that there were any conditions on the, the changing of the zoning and was it linked to the airport? Sorry, it's going to be a multiple part, but it's probably directed at the CA. In, in um, the plan change 93, which Noel Robinson applied for, the rationale for rezoning some of the land surrounding it for commercial type developments was to enable that development to support the sustainability of the prop airport operations. It was based on that, um, and it support the. Yeah. Sorry, I'm chipping away in the mayor's ear. Um, it was the environment court that, that where that was tested, not the council. 
So, so that application went to the Environment Court, who allowed the economic argument to be considered as part of the rationale that it would help, um, that commercial development could help sustain an operating airport. So uh, conditions could not be attached to that, but it was accepted as part of the argument for why commercial development might be permitted, why the rezoning might be permitted. What, sorry, Wayne, what was the... Um um, any discussion in the Environment Court about then the potential sale of those assets which then in the developer's mind would make the airport unsustainable? No, so that's my point, is um, a finding could not attach those sorts of conditions. You couldn't commercially contract someone to have to do that. Um, so that's the tricky bit about it, that part of the evidence that was accepted was that was the rationale, but you couldn't force that to continue forever through an Environment Court process. Thank you. Sorry, it wasn't really a question to you, but it, it, it appears that through um, the machinations of, of the court process that we're in a position where the developers are, are able to sell off what they call the profitable parts of the airport and, and are left with uh, what, what I believe they're saying is an unprofitable enterprise, which you are saying is debatable. Um, so I, I wish you luck in being able to prove that, it, that it's finan financially... Um, Viable, or that you have uh, luck in the Waitangi Tribunal, which is, I think, from my point of view, where this needs to head. Councillor Martin Holiday. Uh, morning, gentlemen, and to your fine as well. Look, I am um, not going to get into the ins and outs of the conversation that's being had here, other than to say, as your ward councillor, I'm very interested in um, in meeting with you and um, being a part of getting a full understanding of both sides and all areas of the story. Uh, so I'm fully informed and, and, and certainly hopefully I can represent you in part at this table um, as well. So um, I look forward to building that relationship. Councillor Coulds, you've got another question. It's a procedural question and possibly for, for Wayne and one of the team. Um, so we've heard a number of questions and obviously from the speakers this morning. There is a request within this paper for a resolution. Um, I'm not a fan of... Um, from past experiences doing one on the fly like now. Um, what I'm looking for is a steer from, um, from Wayne or the staff in terms of if the council wishes to put something in writing supporting uh, the discussion around the airport, whether we could have that uh, discussion over a break and still consider that within the course of the meeting. How would we handle that? I do, I am aware and I hope those that come today are also aware that council have been involved in these discussions. Um, I won't go further into that, but yeah, it's not like we've been doing nothing. Um, so maybe, Wayne, if you'd want to comment around how we could put some... Uh, I've got a... When it comes to item... Um, the next item, we're talking the public speaking time responses. Um, I've got something to put up for the council to, to chew on, see where we go from there. If I may add, yes, um, the Mayor's worked for me on a wording of a resolution that would successfully achieve the outcomes we need without compromising what's good process, and um, we're comfortable with that. So you'll see that in a moment. Councillor Brabner. Apologies for lateness and not hearing the beginning of your um, presentation. So thank you, Tony and George, for coming along today to speak to us. Um, and you may well have covered this um, when you first um, were speaking and I wasn't here. So, so this is the, the, that the land has been sold several times and I'm just wondering, um, do, so I can understand you know, whether you actually um, were offered back this land when it was previously sold or how that, how that fits into this process now. Um, well, um, yeah. So that's now where it is. It's probably the third or fourth owner that's since it was originally sold by the, the government of the time in 1995. Um, For 1.65 million. <laughs> and whatever it's worth now is probably 100 times that. Um, so there's yeah, some real anger about that, what's Indeed. happened. Um, so yeah, hope that answers your question. Councillor Elliott, do you have a question? Oh, no. Councillor Buckwell. So just um, following on from Jocelyn's um, uh, question, so would it be fair to say that um, at this point in time that the difference between previous sales have been the fact that those previous sales 
have withheld the airport as an operating airport and haven't really publicised the fact of changing the airport or closing the airport, whereas it's been muted out in the community that this new owner is potentially going to shut the airport down from its original purpose of being an airport. So, you know, like I'm just trying to clarify the difference between the last three owners and then all of a sudden this owner appears to be different. Um, from the first privatisation of the airport to Murray Cole and Co, it has passed through a number of owners who, and each has profited off these sales to the next owner. The, the difference now is, uh, from information I've received directly from uh, members who have already spoken, the Safe Carpet Airport Group, who have already spoken to the owners, their intention was to make a declaration tomorrow that the airport would be shut down in September. That's been pushed out. So that's how close this is. Um, I've been to the airport. I've seen their workers drilling holes all over the airport. They are very busy identifying what it is they can do, what it is that they're dealing with. They are, um, what seems to be obvious, very committed to that statement. Councillor Randall, you got another question? Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, through you to the Chief Executive, following on what Councillor McCann said, has the Council ever investigated heritage status for the airport land? I mean, we've got zoning requirements, but has heritage status ever been looked at to protect the airport as an airport? I'm sorry, I couldn't answer whether or not that has um, been looked at. Um, I'm not sure that it would be applicable for an operational airport, but, but I can't answer you, sorry. I just wonder, my question should be, are you, is the council prepared to look at heritage status? Um, councillor... We're here to um, meet the aspirations of our community, so we will do everything that we can to achieve those outcomes. Councillor McCann. Not that I pressed my button, but now I've got a question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> multiple people, I hope. Um, has there been any consideration from the Council's legal team looking at what other legal responses there might be, like the possibility of investigating any form of injunction uh, around a potential sale um, to ensure that the Treaty of Waitangi um, claim is heard before a sale proceeds, or if a sale proceeds? I did contemplate doing one myself in terms of the uh, plan change 73 in the, in the rationale that was before the Environment Court. But my own private um, RMA legal advisor said the chances are very slim and you need to have very, very deep pockets. The Chief Executive. Through you, Mr Mayor. Um, I know you noticed how I worded my last answer, so I will repeat it. And I will add by saying I won't be talking publicly about any considerations that we might take in that space. It's not appropriate. I'm not going to hold negotiations through an open forum over a TV screen. Councillor Prabhna. Thank you. Through you, Mr Mayor. So apologies again if this was covered um, before I arrived, but um, so you're saying that, um, that, that claims have been considered by the Treaty of White, um, uh, the tra Treaty of White Tiny Tribunal now, um, so that actually include this, the airport or is it other, other, um, other land? Um, it involves lots of land in the airport. Okay. 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 Well, obviously it's a huge piece of land that were taken at the time so from, from various whānau in, in, in this room today, so... And so waiting for an outcome. Yes, yep. Councillor Compton.
Thank you. In terms of the uh, Waitangi Tribunal report, do you have any idea when that might be coming out? You're saying it was soon, but any idea on what the time frame might be? It's been 18 months so far. Yeah. Councillor Elliott. Um, just a thought. Look, it's sounding really promising as far as your request uh, for us to formally ad adopt your resolution or some form of it. However, I'd like you to tell us in what other ways we as an organisation can support you going forward. Um, um, I certainly don't want you walking out of the door today here to be the end of something where I think this is the very much the beginning of something that we're going to work on together. Uh, so apart from that resolution, what we need is time. As I've said, the airport company is very serious about our, what we fear. Okay. As I said, their original intention was to make a declaration tomorrow. That's been pushed out. We've become part of the Safe Carpety Airport Group because we believe as long as the Carpety Airport is retained, it buys time for options to be discovered. The best thing that we can hope for at this present time is a support from the council to, re to retain the airport as a community asset in order to buy time. In that way, we can look at things in a more, more detailed way, have a really good look at things, see where we stand. Um, no other speakers. Um, thank you, um, Tony and George. If you just sit down, we have, we've got business to go through and we'll cover that. Thank you. Sure. Item number six, um, A, public speaking time responses. So um, I've worked on a motion that I want the councillors to have a look at. Can you put that on? So basically it says, you know, this council, uh, that's my face. This council in supporting the call by the original owners of the airport land for the return of the ancestral land, requests the chief executive to bring back a staff report on progressing this matter. Yep. Um, there's a second. Uh, Um, I'm, I'm going to move that. Seconded by James Coates. It's now open for debate. Um, can I just say that it gives us a clear direction, or gives the Tangata Whenua, the Mana Whenua, a clear direction that we support their call, but gives us space for the chief executives to in, look into the complexities around this and how. It, this can be progress. Gives us time. James. Look, I'm um, in seconding this motion. Um, just going back to the previous councils where there were plan changes, and, and look, I'm not an expert on the plan changes, but I remember. Uh, I'm fairly sure that there were two. There was the 92 or 93, but I think there was one after that, which I was actually, um, and the reason why I say this is in terms of why I'm supporting it, was the only council that voted against it for this very reason in terms of the risk to the airport. And so that was the plan change to allow further development uh, and smaller development in terms of the site. And it, it went against the original proposal from Sir Noel Robinson having seen that proposal in terms of the future of the airport and I was just uncomfortable for that. So it's, um, it's quite sort of surreal sitting here today having this discussion around the future and the risk to the airport. I do believe that it is a um, regional asset for Kapiti, um, and I think that um, the call to allow time is what we're doing here in terms of allowing 
discussions to continue with council and with central government. But I get, I do want to heed the chief executive's call that these are not to be played out in the public. Um, any sensible discussions or negotiations, whether they're with the Crown or with council or both parties uh, in DEWI, is, is not something that's well done um, out in the public. And uh, uh, I hope by doing this we can support those discussions to continue um, and look forward to that report coming back. Anybody else want to speak on this? Councillor McCann. This seems like a very prudent uh, move and I can see why the CE was um, hesitant in answering my questions directly. <laughs> um, and I agree with that. What I would have a question about though is what is the time frame in this particular uh, instance. I know that when we've had some resolutions before about actions that we'd like to take, the time frame hasn't met the expectations of councillors. So could I have an indication of what type of time frame we're talking about? Because what I'm hearing from the public uh, and in the media is that there is some urgency around any action that the council may or may not take. So from a I can respond from a political perspective. It gives me the ability to rattle some cages in government. Um, in terms of the support for the call for the return of the uh, land, uh, ancestral land to the original owners. I can do that. But the second part of it is where the chief executive needs time. I'll, I'll let him speak on that one. Uh, in the normal course of events, it will be the next um, relevant meeting of council, so in one month's time. Um, we can obviously um, schedule an urgent council meeting if there was a reason. Um, I have heard what the submitters said this morning. I've had communication from the company probably two weeks ago saying the airport's remaining open at this stage and you've seen them say that on TV as well. So if we have any sense of that changing then clearly that would change the urgency. Um, but the conversations I've had, if they're to be taken at face value, indicate that nothing would happen before Christmas and um, there is no set date for any such action from what I've been told. Councillor Elliott. Um, yeah, look, thank you. The CE has just answered my question in part as I wanted to know to the date of the next meeting um, and also, um, um, yeah. I'm not. I am going to support this resolution. However, I'm not going to let this resolution go to sleep. This is what you've asked for. Thank you, Councillor Holliday. Uh, thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I was just wondering. We're getting a, going to get a report back from Council. And we're going to progress this conversation. But I was wondering if perhaps we could have some information uh, by um, George and Tony from the Hapu as well giving us a bit of a clearer understanding and perhaps um, a bit more of an understanding of your journey over the past long time, just so that um, we fully uh, have more of a fuller understanding of um, the, um, uh, the situation you find yourself in in regards to this. I dare say it's fairly complex. I'm not asking for a, a large document uh, as such and uh, perhaps even some reference to um, uh, supporting documents that might be online um, that um, you think would be relevant for us to uh, bring ourselves up to speed with would be much appreciated. Um, Councillor Martin, I think um, there is um, reference to Waitangi Tribunal documents purely on the airport one. There can be access. I, I can sort that out for you. Anybody else? Otherwise I'm going to put the resolution moved by the Mayor and seconded by uh, Councillor James Coates. So all those in favour say aye. aye. Those against, carry it unanimously. Thank you very much for coming here and uh, we look forward to working with you. Thank you. Um, the next item is leave of absence. Anybody wanting to bunk off? Sorry, uh, take leave. Any leave of absence? No? <laughs> uh, there's no matters of urgent uh, nature. 
Item number seven, Mayor's report. Any questions on that? No, will somebody move that you accept the Mayor's report? So move, Councillor Elliott, seconded, General Hobo. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Shall we take a break? No. Okay, um, the next report, item number nine, review and update of the waste levy allocation policy 2011, page seven. Katrina. Good morning, uh, councillors and Mr. Mayor. Um, I'd like to take this report as read, uh, seeing that we've already had a briefing about it, um, but I'm here to answer any questions. There being no questions from the table, um, I would like to uh, welcome you to our table, Katarina, and thank you very much for the work behind this, obviously. You've been extremely thorough, and uh, Ninki and the team in informing us with the background information for this change to the policy. I look forward to being able to, through the Grants Committee, to be able to support um, our far wider and more um, you know, a exciting range of uh, waste minimisation activities, and with this, and I would like to move uh, the resolution. Sorry, I haven't seen that the numbers in front of me. 43 and 44. Have I got a seconder? Yeah. Senator Hobbs, seconder. Now open for debate. I didn't really want to debate. I just want to say what a a really well written report was, and uh, I enjoyed reading it. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I just wanted to say thank you for making these changes. I was involved um, a little bit last training um, around these funding allocations, and although it was really heartening to see um, purely innovative ways of um, reducing waste and making them into something else and, and so forth, um, I think that. As a district, we've come actually a long way, and we are now above the um, invention, and we're actually more hands-on, um, wanting production to push forward. And um, and so this kind of indicates to me that that yeah, we've, we've moved on as a district, and it's really exciting to see us funding more um, yeah more projects in a, in a different kind of way. So thank you. On to holiday. Uh, I'd just like to um, build on uh, Councillor Buswell's comments as well. Uh, we've had um, uh, various briefings in regards to this space. Uh, the information's been excellent. Uh, I'll see a lot of time, effort and research has gone into this. Uh, I just want to make it clear that this isn't an, an off-the-cuff thing that we're supporting. Uh, there's been some good process through this and some good consultation as well. So uh, I look forward to see where this is all taking us in the future. Thank you. Right, there's nobody else now. Uh, recommendation 43 and 44 moved by Councillor Elliott, seconded by Councillor Holbro. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those again, carry it. Thank you very much. Um, nobody picked up on the point that I jumped my queue. Uh, we haven't looked at item 8 COVID 19 recovery plan for Kapiti. And thanks to my deputy for not picking up on that. You just <laughs> Morena, everyone, um, I'm here to talk to you about COVID recovery again. Um, and standing by online is um, Harvey Brooks from, from Martin Jen Jenkins. Um, and I'll hand over to him shortly. Um, firstly, I did just want to acknowledge that we are in an uncertain environment when it comes to COVID, um, and this is likely to continue 
as we um, learn to live with having it at our door. Um, there's obviously been a little bit of disruption over the last few weeks with the resurgence in Auckland um, and we've had to take some time to make sure we understood the scale and extent um, of, of this new outbreak and consider what it means for recovery. What it's also made clear is that for this pandemic, unlike many normal emergencies, um, there's not necessarily going to be an orderly transition between response and recovery. Both are likely to need to coexist um, at times. And there is, the, um, the, you know, there is an ongoing risk that recovery will be disrupted um, and set back by future outbreaks. So what this means for recovery um, is that it reinforces that a recovery plan needs to be, um, needs to be a live document it needs to be regularly reviewed and, and refreshed to make sure that whatever track we're on is appropriate given the circumstances as those circumstances change. We will be bringing a recovery plan to you on the 1st of October um, and as I mentioned I'll hand over shortly to Harvey who will talk a little bit more about the plan. But before I do there were just two further things I wanted to touch on. The first one that was regardless of the timing of the plan um, and that it has had a few, a few delays, we're still continuing to undertake recovery actions where it makes sense to do so. And the second thing was that we'll be kicking off some communications with the community um, on recovery and this is really designed to lead into the landing of the recovery plan. We're looking to build on the success of the Love Local videos and in a similar vein, these will be telling some local stories about what recovery has been like for particular sectors of our community. Um, the first one um, is, well, does, it features our, our James Jefferson, our lead controller, and he talks about the journey from response to recovery, and I'll make sure that elected members are sent a link to that so they can have a look at that. So now I'll hand over to, to Harvey, who'll just take you through just a short presentation um, updating where we're at with the recovery work. Thank, thank you, Natasha, and kia ora, your worship and councillors. Can I just check everyone can hear me clearly? Great. Yes. Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Um, as Natasha said, I've got a brief presentation to run through just as a sort of a high level um, summary of the process for developing the plan and how it's shaping, um, and happy to um, um, take your questions uh, following that. Um, so this will be somewhat familiar to you all, I'm sure, just in terms of what the, the recovery plan uh, is aiming to do in terms of setting out visions and goals for recovery, uh, identifying short, medium and long-term actions, communicating the council's work to support the community as it recovers uh, and demonstrating that the actions that the council has underway and um, have already taken to support recovery across the district. Um, again, this will be familiar to those who have um, been in conversations previously in terms of the overarching framework. Um, just one or two little tweaks as we've gone along uh, to that in terms of the vision, which uh, I won't read out to you. Um, it's there and, and hasn't changed. Uh, the, the blue area, pardon me, the, the label is gone, but those are the principles uh, that have guided the plan. Uh, and what we've done is evolved those a little bit uh, the ones on the left uh, as, as they were at the beginning, but we've brought into this uh, the um, Te Ao Māori principles which are consistent throughout the Council's um, strategy and um, operational framework, so we've brought those in as well to reflect uh, that particular um, aspect to the plan um, and that has come through very strongly in terms of the uh, engagements that we've had with um, iwi. Uh, the aims uh, uh, as they as they were there, the three aims, so um, they, they really form the framework and the backbone uh, of the of the plan and then the four uh, phases there and as Natasha said um, this this plan is, is focused on recovery uh, and the three elements there you can see on the bottom right but uh, as Natasha also said um, the, it's, it's not an exact linear process here because uh, COVID-19 as everyone is saying, is a tricky thing. Um, and obviously the situation in Auckland, we hope, uh, represents uh, a temporary uh, blip, um, but there is always a risk that uh, both recovery and response will need to occur depending on future outbreaks uh, if they were to happen. So the plan process, um, uh, we've been working on this for about the last four weeks, uh, and many of you 
uh, have been involved uh, in initial conversations either around the table that you're at today uh, or in one-on-ones with us. Uh, we've also spoken to some of the community board members, uh, council uh, officials, uh, a wide range of stakeholders across the community um, from from the, the general community sector, business, the not-for-profit uh, and government officials. We did hold one uh, small hui with representatives of Te Atiawa, Ngāti Toa and uh, Ngāti Raukawa. Um, they were very, very clear uh, with me that they would they would uh, like to very much like to have some further follow-up engagement uh, as the recovery process continues to reflect that principle of partnership. Uh, the council undertook a survey of 24 social sector organisations, uh, which was very, very useful, and that helped inform our plan. Uh, and the council's economic recovery group has met several times to d- develop and agree actions. Uh, with the support of officials, we met with uh, quite a few of the um, key government agency representatives for the Kapiti Coast in terms of education, social development, uh, the two health boards, Oranga, Tamariki and others. Uh, and that was uh, very, very informative in terms of uh, what they are doing. Um, but I think, I think also very, very um, useful for them to actually meet around the table altogether, which it doesn't seem happens um, uh, a lot. Uh, we met with representatives of the Kapiti Climate Action Group and also Te Puna Oranga Otaki. Uh, and so overall about 100 people and groups uh, were engaged through this process. Uh, the plan structure uh, here, and um, uh, this is really a, a diagram to, to try and indicate that the plan really does rest on those principles uh, that I spoke about uh, and that the vision forms the core of the plan uh, and informed everything uh, that, that we've done and, and the way that we've developed the plan. Uh, the plan sets out the aims I've already mentioned. Uh, we describe a scenario in the plan based on um, the recovery process to date and uh, information that we've gathered from various sources, uh, both at the central government and the regional and the local level. Then sets out a, a suite of actions uh, and the structure of which I'll describe shortly, uh, a monitoring and review framework. So the aims and objectives um, are there in the centre. The three that I mentioned previously around enhancing our well-being, reconnecting our community and reactivating our business and our economy. And so for each of these, what we've done uh, through the feedback and conversations we've had is identified a series of uh, objectives uh, and then underneath those uh, programs of actions and detailed actions. And I won't get into the detailed actions uh, here today, but I'm happy to answer any questions if you'd like to know a little bit more about them. So just quickly then, in terms of enhancing our well-being, on the top left, you can see um, secure and available housing really did come through very, very strongly in a lot of our conversations. And that's not to say that this is something that the council itself needs to uh, become a major supplier or provider of, but that it is a, a critical component of a successful recovery uh, for Kapiti as is health and well-being, and that's both physical and mental health. Uh, education and youth uh, was a very, very consistent theme, um, especially in terms of making sure that the um, transition from education to training to employment uh, is well organised and coordinated, and, and that there are opportunities explored to further develop tertiary education opportunities at Kapiti. Uh, iwi aspirations covered a wide range of uh, topics, uh, but in particular was about making sure that services were tailored and developed for Māori uh, in a way that worked for Māori and that if there are opportunities for Māori to actually deliver those services themselves, um, then that is something to be explored. Uh, On reconnecting uh, our community, um, one of the big uh, themes that came through there was about uh, local pride uh, and local resilience uh, and making sure that that is uh, uh, facilitated. Hi, is it possible to ask a question there? No worries. 
Hello? <laughs> Questions at the end. James, it's Grayson here. Questions at the end. Oh, okay, cool. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, and, and that, sorry, can everybody hear me? Oh, no, he yeah. back for a minute. Yeah. Yes, we can, Harvey. Right, thank you. Uh, cohesion and connectivity was uh, uh, related to making sure that um, uh, some of the arrangements that developed through COVID-19, such as flexible working, working at home, uh, shopping locally, living locally, um, were continued um, and that there is a opportunity to build capacity around volunteering uh, in the community. Uh, sustained partnerships, uh, as I said, um, one of the big, I think, um, um, learnings from this is that there is c continued opportunity for uh, uh, service provision uh, organisations uh, on the Kapiti Coast to work closely together uh, to make sure that, that the services they are providing uh, are fit for purpose uh, and are actually creating value in the community. The arts and culture, strat um, arts and culture sector um, was extraordinarily strong and obviously is a very vibrant part of the Kapiti um, uh, way of life. Uh, and the opportunities there are to support and reinvigorate that and continue to make it a major part uh, of living uh, uh, on the Kapiti Coast. And then climate action, um, there's been a lot of work uh, uh, with the council and with uh, climate groups on the council, uh, on the Kapiti Coast, pardon me, about opportunities to um, um, make the Kapiti Coast more resilient uh, to climate change and for it to start to move towards a low carbon economy. Um, so there are some short term opportunities there in terms of maintaining the gains during the lockdown around uh, working from home opportunities, using less uh, carbon intensive transport, uh, local food production, but also some longer term opportunities around resilient infrastructure. Uh, reactivating our business there, uh, business and local economy. Uh, the local economy element uh, is around opportunities to make sure that local businesses are supported uh, as they as they start to recover from COVID-19 uh, and have access to the advice uh, and the skills they need in order to um, stay successful. Uh, the labour market. Um, does link to some of those other things I mentioned around employment and retraining, training and workforce uh, development and growing future skills. Uh, community wealth is around concepts that, that came through very, very strongly from a lot of people around buying local, developing local supplies, uh, local and social procurement and also Māori business opportunities. Uh, and in that particular regard, um, a strong message that came through was the need to make sure that there is a strong uh, information network between Māori businesses on the Kapiti Coast. Destination promotion uh, is probably fairly self-evident um, in relation to local events uh, and town, sect, uh, town centre activation and also developing the Kapiti Coast story and marketing uh, what the Kapiti Coast has to offer uh, locally, nationally and internationally. And then effective collaboration and leadership uh, is around joined up governance uh, with all the different economic development leaders uh, and groups across the coast, uh, advocating the needs uh, of Kapiti Coast uh, economy to uh, central government organisations in particular who can help out with that and then looking to the future uh, to build those relationships uh, so that every opportunity that is available for the coast um, can be seized. So the way that we've organised uh, these is that uh, sort of looking from left to right in this diagram, we have the aims, we have those objectives, and then under each of those are programmes of actions and specific um, um, initiatives. And for each of those, we've uh, tried to indicate cost, just using a simple low, medium and high uh, spectrum, uh, its impact, in other words, the result it has on, in the real world, low, medium and high, and then the time horizon uh, and recover is a shorter term horizon, rebuild, medium and reimagination uh, slightly longer, and then who the partners are uh, for each of those objectives. So as, as we work that out, there are quite a number of actions, which I'm not going to list um, here because it would take uh, quite some pages, but more than happy to talk 
out some of those with you. And then you can see the whole process then includes a monitoring and review element so that there is continuous learning and continuous improvement uh, as we go along. So just to give a little bit of dimension to uh, some of those attributes, so costs uh, at the top there, and we're talking here about cost to council. Um, uh, low is, is anything up to $50,000, medium between fifty and $100,000, and a high over $100,000. And we're talking here total costs, mainly in terms of OPEX. These aren't really capital uh, initiatives. Uh, the second one in terms of impacts, uh, low is small uh, impacts, probably uh, restricted to a small area or a, a very local community. Medium uh, are moderate, moderately positive impacts that might occur across several communities and high uh, significant impacts that might be district wide. Uh, the horizons there, um, recover, recovery type initiatives uh, are very much in this financial year. Uh, and they would fit within the current budget envelope uh, that the council has. Uh, rebuild and reimagination then go into your long-term plan process. Uh, and the great thing about that is that that then brings in the full special consultative procedure that goes along with the long-term plan uh, and allows you to fully develop these concepts much, much further. Uh, rebuild uh, is the next one or two years, and that would be where you'd uh, look to grab any low-hanging fruit that might be in that period, and then reimagination um, would extend from year three onwards or thereabouts in the long term plan. And those would be much more uh, significant uh, changes that might be structural in terms of the way uh, various um, uh, things work and how they're funded. So, as I said, for each uh, um, uh, element here, each program has about two or three projects within it. Um, the projects that we have indicated uh, might be undertaken by the council work within that um, $250,000 budget envelope that you have for recovery projects um, and, and that, that would be exclusive of any additional external funding that might be uh, attracted to those, to those projects and then as I said all other projects would be scoped and considered as part of the LTP. Um, projects that we've identified would need to be led um, and funded by other organisations uh, would need to be obviously discussed with uh, those organisations and that's where the council would use its relationship and partnership and advocacy role in order to affect, uh, for example, central government funding programmes. So the steps from here, um, we're continuing to re refine uh, the actions with key staff, keeping a close eye on uh, what's happening across uh, the rest of the country um, and making sure that they still remain fit for purpose uh, and as Natasha said um, there will be a final plan uh, presented to you for adoption on the 1st of October uh, and then recovery um, uh, projects will will, uh, will commence and uh, will continue to progress those as appropriate. So thank you Your Worship, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, um, Harvey. I've got a question. Um, we are planning to engage on the long-term plan. You're saying that your program will land in October. Um, so uh, can I take it that what you'll be landing will be a turbo charge into the long-term plan? Do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, yes, yes, Your Worship, and, and that's that, that's my expectation, and, and others uh, who are working on the LTP can can advise also. But yeah, you know, what we've what we've done is is framed up um, these actions um, in a way that they can then then be considered uh, as part of the development of the long term plan, and um, and and then the long term plan can act as the vehicle for a more formal conversation with the community about those. So I, you know, the council has got us many silos of strategies and policies and stuff of like that. Um, have you seen the need to marshal those to what you're doing? Uh, well, I guess that's that's probably what an LTP process does anyway. It, you know, it, it takes it takes all the the various strategies and programs that a council has and um, integrates those in, into a into a plan. 
which it shares with the community. Um, so it, it might be best if I ask Natasha or Wayne to sort of talk about <laughs> she's, that. She's, she's ready with the finger on the, on the button there. Right. Um, y yes, ab absolutely. So the intention is obviously there, is, there are some um, initiatives that are already underway or are going to be worked on for the rest of this year. Um, staff who work in those particular areas and, and in relation to the other areas have been involved in the development of this process as well. So those particular um, staff areas that some of the actions touch on are already um, conscious of the sort of work that we'd be looking to for recovery and they'll be thinking, feeding that into the thinking that they're doing about the long-term plan that will come back to this table. Questions? Anybody else? Uh, it's just me here. Is that just you there? James? James, you got a question? Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. James, where's who was who was who was who was spoken to? You mentioned you spoke to a lot of businesses across the the district. Did you talk to any businesses in Waikanae? Um, James, I would have to get back to you on that because my colleague Patrick McVeigh took care of the um, economic development engagement part of this, so I'd I'd have to get back to you on that. And just one more question um, with regards to. Um, like the Waikanae Library, how, like I can see it was cast in that original uh, documentation. Uh, how, how have you described the, or would you enable the economic benefits to be attributed to that while you're putting that through in the planning process? So, so um, from, from my perspective, um, it is, um, that was a, that was a, um, an issue that was um, in existence before COVID came along, um, and it's an issue which needs to be considered through the long term, through the long term plan, rather than specifically being something which is um, directly related to recovery from COVID. Okay, I get that. Um, thank you, Rob McCann. Thank you, um, three, Mr. Mayor. We just had the major events funding panel meet um, in one. We just had the major events panel meet and one of the things that we found was medium-sized events that fall outside perhaps the, the category of major events might potentially be struggling financially. Um, that I think is new information. Has this been brought to your attention? Or is it too breaking? Um, so there are a number of actions which are related to events on the, on the Kapiti Coast. Um, so, and I, I think um, in terms of when the previous paper which came to Council in relation to the Major Events Fund, I think they were also angling already at a range of um, other events already that they were um, concerned about and I guess feeding into that is the um, current limitations in terms of sizes of events. There's a number of different moving parts in that piece that may very well end up with us needing to look m more at um, smaller events rather than significant events with large numbers of people. Thank you. Anybody else? Angela. Thank you. Um, I just, uh, it was awesome to hear that you have been out and spoken to so many different parties and, and talking to over 100 um, people in our community affected, um, also their groups and that obviously represent more than that. Um, I'm just wondering when those people that participated um, in those talks will actually hear back from you. Will that be after the 1st of October when this recovery plan is adopted or um, will there be further feedback that they can feed into as to whether their, their group was recognised within that? So look, there's probably a, a two different prongs to that answer. One is, yes, obviously when the, the recovery plan um, is, is is landed with a um, back in this forum here um, in October, um, but also as I've talked to the doc, the intention is for the document to be a living document, um, and we will be continuing to have conversations about the actions um, and working with various partners 
on implementing those actions, um, and that will enable us, you know, this is the start of a conversation, this is not the end of it. Councillor Elliott. Um, thank you, Natasha. Um, I noticed that um, destination promotion is right up, up there, and I know in the past few weeks that we've had an email discussion about um, the, some of the, the requirements or, or wishes from the motorhome and caravan associations. And I kind of feel as though I would like to keep proceeding with that conversation um, with you and other staff on the basis that I'm not talking about freedom camping, but I'm talking about something quite different, a very different market and a very, very lucrative domestic market that we've got trapped here. That, um, and just having it, I hope that um, you and staff will be open to just a little discussion about how that could possibly be a low-hanging fruit in this work stream. I'm not... Yes, yeah, so, yes, thank you very much, Councillor Early. I think probably the... Um, Next, next best step with that, um, the, the government has recently opened its um, responsible camping fund, which we were successful with some funding last year, and we're also going to look at um, applying again this year. Um, there is also some new, um, there was a pre-COVID, there was a conversation about reviewing the legislation which governs um, freedom, freedom camping in the district as well. So there is some more information that we can get for you and it's probably a matter of um, you having a conversation with the um, manager who's responsible with that area and, and working out what we do with it from there. Okay. Who would that be? Thanks. Right. Um, nobody else? Thank you, Natasha, and, and thank you, Harvey, if you're still there. Right, back to item 9.2, selecting the electoral system for local body elections, page 35. Closing this at the end. that one really quickly. Yeah, yeah you did. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to take a five-minute break, Mr. Mayor? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. maybe we'll, we'll take a five-minute break then. 10.45, you're back.